Top Bird Talk. We are here on the evening of day two of EBPOM USA 2018 in Atlanta. And I'm sitting down with Monty Mython, who is my co-host here on Top Med Talk, as well as Dr. Paul Wishmeyer, professor of anesthesiology and surgery at, at Duke Anesthesia. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other roles that he has there at Duke. Here at Top Med Talk, we've actually had several interviews with you in the last several months. And so we were just kind of wanting to catch up with you and see Great. how things were and, and what's going on. Monty, you were talking about uh, some of the other roles that, that Paul has yeah. played. So, so Paul, we know each other well now. We do. In an adjunct position at Duke, I've visited a number of occasions. Yeah. Tell me about a few of your other roles. Just one at a time, we'll explore them briefly. Sure. So one of the key reasons I came to Duke, and it's a real passion for me, is to direct the perioperative research area for the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Uh, focuses on clinical trials, large both industry and, and federal clinical trials to try to change our field and improve the data and the evidence base of which we practice on. Right. Now, Duke Clinical Research Institute, very, very well known internationally, does these extremely yes. large trials, observational trials. Yeah. Et, et and you've got any big wins recently in that area? Any new trials coming down the line? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Again, DCRI is the largest academic research organization worldwide, I discovered after I came. And we have, we've got some exciting large trials looking at new agents for surgical site infection. We're looking at a large international trial to look at some topical interventions, especially in high-risk patients, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, patients who have malnutrition and other high-risk factors for surgical site infection and interventions we might use to improve them. And then some other key areas have been around, uh, obviously, the nutrition field, an area of personal interest for me as also the director of nutrition for Duke, looking at the role of our new POET clinic on outcome and the POET process, not just one piece of it, but the entire perioperative nutrition care pathway that we're implementing and looking at the effect of that on improving outcomes from surgery. You gave us a talk earlier on today about nutrition. It's available on Top Med Talk and yeah. everyone was you know, very enamored by all of that. But within that, you, you shared some of your personal story yeah. as a patient. So my passion for, for perioperative care, honestly, evolves from my experience beginning at age 15 with inflammatory bowel disease, where... You know, I, I went from being a, a high school uh, freshman playing basketball on my, my basketball team to getting strep throat over Christmas, took an antibiotic, and a few days later started to bleed when I would go to the bathroom and it didn't stop and was diagnosed not two weeks, three weeks later with an ulcerative colitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and told I was going to enter the hospital and not eat for a month and be started on TPN and all these things. I'd never even seen the inside of a hospital at that point in my life. And ultimately went on to spend about six months on TPN in the hospital. Eventually my colon perfed. I ended up in septic shock, um, had my colon taken emergently, spent basically the better part of that year in the hospital. And then through the course of my life, I've had 22 other abdominal surgeries, leaving me with about 170 centimeters of small bowel, mainly for bowel obstructions over time, the, the, the sort of routine adhesions, unfortunately, that so many of the GI surgery patients get that we never talk about. And so it's been interesting to experience that now as both perioperative and critical care provider, who then becomes perioperative and critical care patient within my own hospitals and with my own caregiving friends and staff caring for me it's, it's an interesting experience so, so from i'm going to ask some questions from a doctor's perspective absolutely and then desiree will ask some from a nurse's perspective if that's okay desiree we also got henry how with us who's a medical student i'm Wonderful. sure we'll have some yeah some views on this as well so sure. from the patient you my first thing is paul you you look great you, you look you. extremely physically fit. You wouldn't guess healthy. that that was a story in the background. You look very healthy. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm sure a part of that is looking at your physique is that you keep yourself very physically fit and nutrition is Absolutely. extremely important to you. Nutrition yeah. and exercise are essential parts of my life that I can't live without. So, so well done you. Yeah. Okay. Now some tips for us. What could we do better as doctors in the first instance? Sure. I, I think one of the primary things that, that has always troubled me, and I, I don't think has changed in the 20 or 30 years that I've spent as both patient and now, now physician and patient, is more and more I even think patients are seen as jobs to be done, boxes to be checked. Um, the fact that there's actually a, a, a person laying there rather than a central line to be placed, an A line to be placed, or a, a, a procedure or something else to be done to I feel is, is waning by the day. Um, to explain what I mean, I'm going to relate just one brief story. 
about three years ago, I was fortunately in the hospital with a bowel obstruction and had, a, had an emergent operation. And of course, in good heiress form, I had an epidural for my GI surgery. And of course, the pain team would come around, and these are my colleagues in my department, they would come around and check my epidural every day. Well, one particular day, I was having a particularly difficult time with my ostomy. It was bleeding, it was stooling, I am completely naked. Mm in pain, standing in the bathroom, trying to salvage uh, the function of my ostomy and the pouching system. And the pain team with eight people, all of whom I know, medical students, residents, nurses, the like, come into the room and say, we need to examine your epidural site. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in a, in a bad place here. In fact, I'm in a really bad place here. Could you please come back? Mm -hmm. And they said, you know what? No, no, no. Don't worry. This will only take a minute. And so they parade all eight people into the bathroom, the small bathroom that hospitals have, to examine my epidural site while I'm nearly in tears, yeah. stool and blood pouring from my side. And it's more important to them to get my epidural looked at than it is the fact that I'm in one of the most vulnerable states of my life. Thankfully, my wife, who's a ICU PA, stopped into the room and basically threw them out like the unfortunate souls they were and asked them never, ever to come back. And it made us realize if they treat me as their colleague and potentially senior physician like that, how do they treat the people they don't know? How are they treating the patients they don't have a relationship with? And, and, and what does it say about us as, as a profession? So how, when did that, that sounds inhumane to me. Was that because they were under pressure to get the boxes checked? Did they need to get back to the computer? Did they need to get back to the billing system? What, where do we lose the plot on that? I don't know. You know, I, I don't know where empathy left our, our world in some cases and, and where this need to be task-driven entered it. Uh, you know, I have to say, even looking back to when I was a child, the two groups of people that I actually had really good relationships with that I thought really cared about me were the medical students, yeah. the University yeah. of Chicago, and the nurses. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're the people I remember as the ones who I actually thought wanted to communicate with me, actually cared about me as a person, and actually really were the people I looked to as caregivers and ho hopefully advocating yes for you absolutely yeah absolutely sure. yeah. So Henry you're a medical student where, where are you from Henry I, I'm from Bristol University I'm from London originally okay what stage are you at in your training so I'm, I'm a fourth year medical student I've, uh, I'm actually integrating this year so I've done three years only one year in my clinical but that's very sad to hear Paul actually um, how we interact with patients and how all medical professionals interact is so important because it's the general overall picture of healthcare that's that's who they see that's who they they progress with and, and it's very sad to hear that, that you put in such a vulnerable situation so, Henry are you as part of your training uh, do you get much training to try and not behave like the story we just heard uh, ab absolutely absolutely how, how we interact with our patients from a medical student aspect is so important and, and they drill that into us from an early stage I, you know, I, I don't know. I, from a physician standpoint, I don't know how that is taught here. Um, I know for nursing, uh, we are taught to be patient advocates. Yep. I mean, we are the frontline providers you are. there with you that can come in, in with you and say, no, you need to leave. Uh, unfortunately, time constraints and things like that are causing issues mm. for even our profession, those that are supposed to be mm. there for you at all times. Um but, you know, I think it boils down to, you know, bringing, bringing the, the team together and having that discussion about um, empathizing and trying to, to figure out kind of the shared decisions and education and all those points uh, as well. But, I, you know, I, I'm just taken aback yeah, by I, the, that, that this still can happen. It does. And, and, and I really feel like... The time constraint and checking the boxes is a major point for that. Yeah, the so. the, the patient-doctor relationship is so vital for how we, as medics, portray ourselves. Because if it's not there, and if it, it, it's a, it is definitely a two-way system, you can't you can't treat patients without having their input mm -hmm. and making sure they feel absolutely most comfortable. And and that's why that situation is is very sad to hear. Paul, you said the medical students you had contact with were as Henry is describing. Do you think they lose it over time? I think they do. I think, unfortunately, um, healthcare, with the pressures that it has, becomes more and more of an assembly line. It is. Like we're yeah. making cars or fixing cars rather than caring for 
humans and caring for people, I've always dreamed that the ideal way to teach empathy to a medical student would be to have a medical student act out a patient role and then have procedures done to them by their classmates that they will see again tomorrow. Things like IVs or NG tubes or other things that are uncomfortable and they'll have to see them again. I always say to my trainees, imagine that your husband, your wife, your mom laying there would you stick them 17 times for an A-line? Right. Would you do that? You wouldn't. But I just watched you stick someone 17 times, a nurse told me. Yeah. It, why would you ever do that? Because you'd never do that to someone you cared about. Mm-hmm. How can you tell me that, that, that this is the case? And I've always thought if they could experience that and have to have feedback, yeah. it would fundamentally change who they are as people so Paul, in that, and caregivers. In that group that did that to you, yeah. uh, did you manage to debrief with them afterwards? Have you given them that lecture? Have they heard this? They might be hearing it now. Yeah, they might be hearing it now. Hopefully they are. Well, I think my wife gave it to him pretty good. They never came back. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, I, think, I think because I have a, a, a family member who's in healthcare and, and, and works in the hospital, I think she had words with them that really weren't debriefing the, words. They were well-meaning. They were, they were. They lost the plot somewhere. They did. They did. And, and they're all people I've known for many years. Yeah. Um, virtually all of them. Maybe the students, not, not them. But... but it was led by the leaders of this team who I've known for many years that yeah. just said, no, no, we're just going to come in anyway. Well, some, maybe it and might be like a level of comfort. To perhaps. They think. Perhaps. You know, they think that that's what it is. Perhaps. So. And, 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 and we, we mustn't forget all of that. So, yes. so one of the very specific yeah. things I yeah. want to ask you about, because we've shared this story before, yeah. is we've recording one of the priority areas for Top Med Talk this year is the so-called opioid crisis. Yeah. We've heard lots of shocking stories, lots of issues about people walking away with large bags of oxycontin. Mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. You've experienced some yeah. of this personally. So, yeah, it, it became very real to me even as early as 15. You know, the first time I got Demerol, which, which is how I was treated as a, as a 15-year-old in the 80s, um, the birds sang, the heavens opened, flowers bloomed, I loved my mother, and all my troubles seemed to go away. And, and I, I vividly remember that um, experience. And at the end of all of the surges I had that year, I remember I had been getting Demerol regularly, and they just came in and said, we're just going to stop it. And that evening, um, over about a 12-hour period, I I felt something I'd never felt before, this incredible anxiety, which was not a word I knew at 15, and needing something, and that I would rather be dead than to feel this way. Mm -hmm. And I was withdrawing from opiates. Mm -hmm. But no one could tell me that. And so the surgeon said, oh, maybe you're having sort of some, some... issues with the pain meds and we'll do a quick three four day taper and we'll just get you off well they did that and of course soon they sent me home this incredible anxiety came back my parents didn't know what to do they brought me back to the hospital i was admitted to an inpatient adult psychiatric ward for seriously and sometimes criminally insane people in the inner city of chicago where i spent two weeks when all i was experiencing was opiate withdrawal but they recognized it as some severe anxiety disorder i must have put me on stelazine and other very powerful drugs I slept under a ping pong table the first three nights because I was so terrified of the other adult patients Mm. in the unit at the time. And it was a locked unit. I couldn't leave, and my parents couldn't get me out. And so that was my first experience with it. And then, you know, I guess the rest of my life, I I knew this was an issue for me, and so I always had trouble getting off the the opiates. But then it became very real in 2003, Mm. when now as a physician, an attending physician, Mm. I was having multiple dilations of, of, a, of a strictured stoma and I would be written by my resident colleagues I was supervising for oxycodone this new drug and they would give me hundreds of them and I would take them and I was very stressed about the fact I was probably coming to surgery and I can't lose any more gut or I'd be short bowel and mean TPN and I would take them and ultimately I did have surgery three times and um, was on 500 milligrams a day of oxycodone at that point and about and I just want you to digest that for a second. Four to five hundred milligrams of oxycodone as a functioning, working physician. I was asked to come back to work by my chairman two weeks later on that much. So for those people yeah. who may not be familiar with the drug and the doses, yeah. but give us some perspective on that. If I, had, if I was yeah. hurting bad now and I needed a tab. Oh. So the average dose, we would send someone out on is five to ten milligrams every four to six hours. So maybe 40 milligrams a day. So this is mm-hmm. ten times the typical dose that a patient would take because of I'd been on it for so long. And my chair came to me on these doses about two weeks after my last surgery and said, you know, we are down a liver transplant anesthesiologist because we had someone get called up to the military. Do you think you can work? And I said, you know, I'm on 400 milligrams a day of oxy. Do you think that's okay? And he said, well, do you feel okay? And I said, I do. He's like, well, let's work on weaning you off. Hmm. I guess one lesson is your colleagues and your chairman should never be your doctor. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and he, who I love him dearly, he was an outstanding chairman, an outstanding person. Um, 
you know, tried to get me off. Yes. And, and, and it wasn't happening. The withdrawal I would experience was debilitating to where, uh, you know, I would vomit and I would shake and, and I was non-functional. And I thought, well, I have to be able to work. So I have to take these drugs. And if I don't take these drugs, I'd get down to 100, and I, would, I could never get below that without severe withdrawal. Wait, were you addicted? I was addicted, clearly. D- did you know that you were addicted? I absolutely did, but I didn't think there was anything anyone could do. It was like being possessed by a demon. And every day I'd swear I'm not going to take these. But I couldn't go but two hours, and I would feel so terribly that I had to take them. And I actually imagined I would never again in my life ever feel normal. And then I'd always be possessed by this demon that could destroy my mind and my body, and I would never escape this. Is that particular drug uh, an, an issue here, or is it the, the broad class it of drugs? It was pushed, it? I mean, for a long time. Well, and it's the drug. I have to say, I've taken every kind of opiate there is, and that is unique. You know, yeah. I ultimately went to rehab for this, yeah. and I said, you know what? Uh, luckily, my chairman came to me and said, Paul, you're struggling. Do you need help? And we have a wonderful system health program in Colorado. Yeah. And they said you're going to rehab and I said okay well can you know can I go in a week and they said no no you're going tomorrow and I spent three and a half months in a physician rehab in Virginia um, and it was it was one of the best things I ever did for myself and and they taught me how to get off these drugs Mm. and I learned in there that if you're a heroin addict because there were plenty of those too the only drug they will take other than heroin is oxy it feels different but what's different about it, too, is the withdrawal is immensely different. Right. I can take hydrocodone. I can take codeine. I can take even Dilaudid as a patient. And I can work my way off those. I was never going to work my way off Oxy without That's help. It is never discussed. Fun- fundamentally, that there is no reason anyone should get oxycodone for any reason but cancer and terminal pain. And I tried to teach my residents that, but I watched them prescribe it for ortho patients and colorectal patients. We're devastating people because that drug causes withdrawal that is different. Henry, you wear this? Yeah, well, I, I am. I, I just want to ask, just so everyone knows, what, what kind of withdrawal symptoms were, were you seeing? On, on, yeah. Yeah. It's overwhelming anxiety. Like, y- you are so anxious. You have such a need and, and such an overwhelm, you can't sleep. I went to Hawaii for mm-hmm. 10 days thinking I'm going to go cold turkey it and I'm going to get better. I, didn't, I don't remember sleeping for five minutes of that 10 days, and I felt as bad on the 10th day as I did on the first day. It was never going to go away, I thought. And luckily, there are rehab programs that use tricks that I've now learned from my patients that no one teaches us with Ultram and Clonidine and Phenobarb. And Ultram is the, is the be-all, end-all of getting off these drugs without suffering. And I use it every time I come out of surgery. My arm surgery, I'm, I'm taking it now mm-hmm. to work. I just had a major arm surgery a few days ago. And um, had I not been worked off with this combination that rehab centers know and none of the rest of us are taught, and now there's publications jam on it, thankfully, but they weren't. Um, I don't know that I ever would have gotten off. So, so it's a real, ox- this concern we have about opioids in particular, certain types of opioids is a real, real issue. The Absolutely. other thing is awareness. We, we've had some discussions about this recently. A- a- awareness for all of us. We've all got to look after each other. We're all at risk of this happening. Absolutely. We're all at risk of someone saying, tape a couple of these, I'll help you sleep. Yep. If that does happen to us, we've got to be prepared to put our hands up and say, I need help. Mm. And that yes. help has to come without criticism or blame, yes. or it has to be supportive help, doesn't it? And, and I think for the anesthesiologist in particular, this is the number one cause of death in anesthesiologists in the is. United States yeah. under 40. And it's true in other specialties as well, cardiac surgery, nursing has issues with this. I was never judged. I was never threatened with my license. Yeah. Yes. I was never so told lucky. they're going to take this away. Mm. Um, the reality is we as our colleagues all see it in our f- Every colleagues. Every day. We know it's happening. Yep. And we're always afraid to tell anyone because we're afraid people will lose their jobs. Mm-hmm. You don't. Yeah. Most states in the U.S. and other places have protective mechanisms that if you're compliant with all of these mm-hmm. interventions that the caregivers of know how to do this prescribe, you're not going to take your license. You're not going to lose your job. I didn't, I didn't have any of those things ever put upon me as long as I was again compliant. Yeah. And I, of course, wanted to be. I, I didn't want to be possessed by a demon for the rest of my life that Oxy created. Wellness programs and supportive yes. programs that and, we can and work so together. We have to report to our friends and to our colleagues when this is happening. People die. We had um, an anesthesiologist in my residency program die of propofol overdose. I discovered propofol is the yeah. fastest growing drug abuse in our specialty. And Oxy has created a whole nother level of the patient addict. That and we, is we I was just going to say the patient is the problem. The patient is we the problem. Have, we, have all, we have support of we our do. colleagues. We have resources, yeah. but patients, patients do not. We're creating this, and Oxy is unique. And I wish it would never be prescribed by my residents to anyone but the terminal cancer patient. 
Henry, young, uh, young medical students, for final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, for me, it sounds very similar to mental health as well. Uh, very, very similar sort of pathway where a lot of people are scared to, to reach out and, and look for that support. And it's, it's crucial within the profession yes. that we are to, to, to get support when needed. The, <coughs> the problem is, I mean, again, we have support. We understand we what all this means. We understand the pharmacokinetics. I mean, we understand all those things. Patients do not. No. And, and what, is, what do we need to talk to our patients about? I mean, how, how do we have that conversation with them? I think a key piece... And Especially these chronic pain patients. Yeah, and, 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 and patients who've had major procedures yeah. or ICU stays. You yeah. know, uh, I spoke for Wesley Lee and Pratik. You know, they are very advocates of post-ICU care and post-hospital um, care. And they said the one novel thing that I said was patients after ICU and after big surgeries are all withdrawing. Yeah. If they're on the opiates anxiety more than, of all of them. If they're on <laughs> opiates more than two weeks, yeah. I can guarantee you they're withdrawing from these fentanyl drips and these oxys that we give them. And... And they suffer, and mm-hmm. we don't address that with them. And we think yeah. somehow they're going to go home and they're going to figure this out on their own. I couldn't figure out it on my own as a trained clinical pharmacologist yeah. and anesthesiologist. I couldn't figure it out. Mm-hmm. So us being willing to say, you're likely to feel this way. This is what you're feeling. This anxiety is the withdrawal of these drugs. Mm-hmm. Here are the ways you can combat it. Using a little Altram displaces the drug from its receptor, cuts the withdrawal without persisting the addiction and the withdrawal cycle. Little clonidine reduces the tachycardia and the anxiety also as well. And when it really gets bad, of course, you can use other adjuvants too. But honestly, Ultram is really the only thing I've ever needed since. So, Paul, in our criti- a cohort of our critically ill patients from London, we reported mm. about 50% of patients had post-traumatic stress disorder, yep. what appeared to be, and anxiety was way up on the list. Do you think a lot of that is the withdrawal as opposed to the illness? Mm. I think some of it is. I think, you know, I, I think the PTSD and some of the other things are definitely real. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's still things that uh, create serious adversity to me to the point where I actually am rather pleasantly happy I'm not in the OR anymore because the smells, yeah. it's not the sights uh-huh. and the sounds, it's the smells of the OR yeah. bring back all those memories of being a 15-year-old wheeling back to have sort of this life-threatening surgery done, and I still smell them when I walk through. Um, they're, they're triggers, and they, they trigger us. But I do think... The benzo withdrawal is just as bad or worse. It can last for a month. Uh, I think all of these drugs cause this precipitous withdrawal that creates this incredible anxiety that leads to many people never being able to get out of it um, if Gosh. they don't get help. Yes. And we don't yeah. ever address this as a possibility for them. I, I, I think that as a, a, an organization and group, um, it's, it's about for us to, with patients, withholding judgment. Yes. <laughs> you know, this we is can't. a consequence of your care. It is. And addiction is a disease of the body. It is. You know, yeah. our brains, those of us that have been sadly through this, our brains are never going to be the same. No. You can do it's electron microscopy. Mm-hmm. On electron microscopy, the nerve fibers in the brain look different mm-hmm. after exposure, especially as a child. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I think mm-hmm. it resonates with all of us as providers, as patients, um, and everyone in this space. Thank you so mm-hmm. much. Of so it's important um, you're getting this message it, out. It, absolutely it is. And the discussion right now is so poignant yeah. for all of us across in the U.S. and abroad. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, we are going to wrap things up for day two at EBPOM yep. USA 2018. Thank you. Yeah. Join Thanks us tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.